Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. And today, well, I am dead tired, but I'm back in Austin after being in St. Louis, Missouri this morning. And I was in St. Louis, Missouri for Supercomputing 21 conference. But while I was there last night at like 9.30 p.m., I ran into Raja Kadori. And if you don't know Raja, he's actually SVP and GM of Intel's Accelerated Computing Systems and Graphics Group. So basically, you know, he is the GPU guy at Intel. And by extension, that also means supercomputers and HPC. And that is exactly what supercomputers computing is about. And so when I saw Raja, we said like, hey, hi, let's go grab a beer. And well, one beer turned into two, which turned into like, I don't know, like six or something like that. And we basically chatted until pretty close to like 3 a.m. this morning. And so I'm sorry that I'm so low on energy right now. I feel totally bad. But on the other hand, I really wanted to go and capture some of the things that we talked about, because what we talked about basically for hours, uh, among other things, was really how Intel plans to go and increase the supercomputers or the high performance computers, but the really the supercomputing performance of the world, basically from where we're now at like something like one exaflop or so of computing power today, all the way up to about one zettaflop. So about 1000 times as much compute power by like 2027 or so. And a 1000 X improvement in terms of performance in only like five years is like almost unheard of, right? That is absolutely crazy. But Raj actually sat me down and, you know, we were having beers and he was showing me, well, you know, here are all the steps that we would go through to go and capture that 1000 X performance increase. Now he didn't have my full video setup because this was just kind of more of a, this was not like a super planned uh, thing or anything like that, right? So I didn't have all my stuff, but I did manage to take three photos of some of the just kind of sketches that Roger made as he was going and explaining Intel's strategy for the next like five years in supercomputing. And so I think the bartender was like, okay, these guys have been sitting around drinking for a while. Maybe I should go bring them some food, but the kitchen wasn't open. So we actually got Cool Ranch Doritos and uh, you know, she put them on, on the plates for us and then brought them over and so I actually, you know, I took the photos of these things. I was like, oh my gosh, there's like chips and we're talking about chips. So I'm going to call these Raja's chip notes. I'm not very creative. So that's basically what comes out of my head at like 2 a.m. So let's get into this and let's kind of go through what Intel's plan is to go deliver that 1000X performance gain. And before we get too far in this, just a couple notes. Uh, number one, Intel was paying for beers. So I guess I'm, I'm, we're not going to call this sponsored, right? I mean, this is middle of the night beers, like whatever is Bud Lights and stuff. Uh, but then the second big one is just the fact that I do want to say that Raja did say like, hey, you know, this is basically the plan, but there's some stuff here that we really haven't figured out. We, there are inventions that still need to be done and need to be made. And so, you know, we don't necessarily have all of the technology in our back pocket to go and do this 1000X. So we are kind of making some assumptions. So there is some risk to the schedule. So I just want to be clear that this is like the kind of plan, but he has a general idea in terms of steps and the performance buckets that he would go after to be able to deliver that kind of performance gain. Because 1000X is just absolutely crazy. And we're going to kind of break down how that came about. Okay, so let's start with like the first page that, you know, Raja sketches. And this one is really, you know, usually in, you know, consulting would have called this like a waterfall model. But this is basically, you know, how Raja is thinking about where he's going to go get the performance to go get that thousand X. And it comes in a series of multipliers compared to today's systems. Now, today's exascale systems are just kind of getting installed. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're coming out really in like 2021 is when the world is really hitting exascale. We're going to start seeing new computers come online next year. And one of them is the Aurora computer. And that's actually going to be based on Intel Ponte Vecchio and also Intel Sapphire Rapids CPU. Now, Aurora is actually slated, and on the website it says that it's going to be two exaflops, but um, my guess is it's actually going to be a little bit higher than that, because if you kind of do the math, you'll, you'll, we'll see why in a little bit. But let's kind of go through the big performance areas. Now, the first one that Roger really talked about is really architecture. And that has by far the biggest multiplier. And Roger basically said, hey, look, you know, we know how to go do these matrix math ups you know, operations and all that kind of, we know the things that we would need to go do to go deliver like a 16 X improvement in performance. And he actually said like, I'm not gonna give you the actual number, but a number much larger than 16, they actually know how to go do. But one of the challenges, if you go too aggressive there is that basically you make a system or a GPU that is really good at doing Limpack, but it's not necessarily good at like all, or I guess a wide variety of different HPC workloads. Something that you see in the market like right now is just the fact that NVIDIA has their A100, which they are really actually billing now more as like a AI accelerator because 
you, you know, Jensen and, and those folks are actually leaning into the whole AI thing. The AMD folks, they have their MI200, which we covered uh, earlier, I guess about a week ago. And the MI200 is interesting because really AMD focused on a lot of this kind of like double precision math performance, but they didn't necessarily get as big of a bump in terms of their like kind of AI performance. Well, Ponte Vecchio is actually designed to also have a lot of AI functionality along with the kind of traditional math that you would use in HPC simulation. And one of the big things in terms of architecture, if you ever talk to Raja, like, I mean, I've probably heard him say this, I don't know, half a dozen, dozen times. I have no clue how many times, but a lot. He definitely talks about the idea that, you know, you need to not just have a lot of execution units because you can make your execution units very fast, but that's only part of the battle. The other part of the battle is actually making sure that you have data to feed those execution units and really get the data to those execution units fast and efficiently. And what that practically means is that you need a lot of bandwidth and you need relatively low latency on being able to deliver data that a core needs to go in and you know process and you know kind of needs for its computation. You actually need to go and deliver that data very, very quickly to the cores. Otherwise the core is just sitting there and it's like, well, I would love to go do something right now, but I can't because I don't have any data. And so Raja said that it's pretty easy for him to go and say like, hey, look, if we just want to go do Linpack performance and we just want you know our double precision performance, like we can totally go do that. But then it would be a very much a Linpack product and be a thousand X and that's like really cool, but it wouldn't necessarily accelerate a wide variety of applications. But his kind of thing, it seems like he's going for more of a wider variety and maybe not everything is going to get, you know, a thousand X speed up. But even if you got a hundred X speed up in five years, like most people are not going to go complain about that. And if you got a four or 500, that's also really good as well. But, you know, different applications will have different speed up amounts just based on, you know, if they're more memory bound, compute bound and what the capabilities of the chip are, right? But that's really the 16X. The next one is around power and thermals. Now, this one was actually really interesting and I don't wanna to get too much into the specifics because this is not actually on the thing and I don't wanna go and say things that maybe are not on this page that uh, would get anybody in trouble. But the basic idea here is that Roger says like, you know, hey, if we can lower the operating voltage of the chips, and that may also require more cooling to be able to do that. And there's you know, also some materials advances that might have to happen to be able to go and lower those voltages. But if we can do that, well, that means kind of like two things. First, our chip is able to use less power. And that means that if we had say 50 megawatts to be able to go deliver that exaflop or zetaflop or whatever it is, well, if we are able to run at lower voltages and lower power for each chip, well, then we can actually put more chips in a system and then get more performance from that. Now, something that we have seen in a lot of CPUs and GPUs lately is that you're kind of seeing this kind of like really interesting thing, right? You're seeing that the TDP, so the amount of power that a chip can dissipate is actually going up. But at the same time, the T case, and you kind of think of T case like uh, in this context, like like the uh, you know uh, maximum uh, temperature that you want of your chip, right? That that, that number has actually been going down. So they're actually generating more heat, but then they can't run as, as, as hot of temperatures. And so that's actually something that we are seeing in the industry and that is pushing us towards liquid cooling. So if you missed it, you should totally go check out our liquid cooling uh, run around on the SC21 show floor or when we actually did the eight NVIDIA A100 systems, both air-cooled versus liquid-cooled, just to kind of see the difference. Uh, the the Definitely the power and thermal management stuff. I think that is definitely a big area. And Raja says it gives you about a 2x uh, improvement if you can go and, and capture all that. Now, Raja actually told me that data movement, he thinks is like a 3x uh, improvement in terms of you know what you can really get if you optimize that. And just to kind of give you an idea, we talked a little bit about you know, efficiently being able to feed cores, but the other side to it is just that as you know, data goes to all different places in a GPU. I mean, think about it, you have some caches, you have like HBM, and then you have all these execution cores that have their own fabric. And so you may have to go pull, you know, data from HBM and then go put it into a cache or, you know, whatever the heck you need to go do. But all that moving around of data actually sucks a ton of power. And if you have to go off the actual package and you have to go you know, somewhere else to go get data, I mean, that can be an absolutely huge and super expensive in terms of power operation. If you take that a step further, well, what happens when you have a CPU and a GPU and you have to start transferring data between the two of them? Well, that would be a good example of where, you know, moving that data is super expensive because you're going off of one package and onto another package. And so all of that combined, you know, I think Intel is really looking at that and saying like, hey, that actually uses a huge amount of power in a modern chip. And so if it uses so much power, well, then maybe that is an opportunity to go and do some optimization. And again, if we do that optimization, I think they can get something like a 3x performance improvement. Now, one of those we're going to talk about a little bit later, but we're going to start talking about silicon photonics and 
a lot sooner than some folks might think. Okay, now the next big bucket is process. And this is one that I think a lot of folks just kind of like, that's where they zero into because it's, you know, some number decrements and it becomes very easy to just say like, oh, well, that was that was 10 and now it's seven. And like, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people can just kind of gravitate to and they just kind of latch on and say like, hey, well, if you just kind of keep shrinking stuff, you're, you're not going to get a thousand X improvement. But it's really that if you keep shrinking stuff, you may get maybe like a five X improvement. But I actually think what Raja means here on process is more than just kind of going down to smaller and smaller nodes. Something else that I think Intel definitely learned, especially with Ice Lake and like that, that kind of product is really just the fact that like, hey, you know, there is a benefit to having a you know, multi-die or a tiled architecture. Ponte Vecchio uh, basically takes that concept and gives it a giant bear hug with like 47 different tiles on it. I and mean, that's just absolutely wild. And basically embracing this whole multi-die and multi-tile approach, really what that does is it mitigates your risk of, you know, if something goes wrong in a new process, you have at least options to go out to different fabs and you can go integrate, you know, you have more manufacturing capacity potential and all that kind of stuff. So I think that it's actually a really important bit. And the other thing that I, uh, it's not necessarily on these slides, but just kind of as a conceptual model that Raja used with me is like, hey, you know, think of it like you have like kind of like everybody's talking, all these different tiles are talking to each other like with an API or something like that. So there's kind of like a standard interface that as long as you can deliver your tile with your functionality and you know you have the right interfaces, well then we can go and start designing everybody else's tiles. Uh, with those assumptions and that we can start building chips with that model. It's actually kind of interesting and just something that I thought would be, uh, you know, just kind of interesting to share. Of course, part of this whole processing and getting that 5X also means that Intel does need to continue to execute on bringing new process nodes online. Pat Gelsinger, their CEO, has actually said, yep, we got a whole bunch of new stuff coming, get ready. But at the same time, I think that Intel does need to do a little bit of work in terms of just showing folks like, you know, it's one thing to say that, oh yeah, we're fixed and everything's gonna be better, but it's another thing to actually just kind of show that, you know, hey, we've regained our ability to, you know, have that, you know, good track record and really deliver new nodes on a regular basis. So if we take Aurora as like kind of the you know, system that's gonna be around next year, that's already two times faster than Exascale because let's call that a two exaflop system. And so that's kind of really the starting point to get us to the Zeta scale, right? And so already at two exaflops, and then we get 16 for the architecture. Power and thermals are 2X, data movement is 3X, and process is 5X. And if you multiply that all together, I think you get something like 960 or so. So it's not quite a 1000X, but there is a little nuance to this that is super important. If you look at what Aurora is actually spec'd at, it's not that it's two exaflops. It's actually that it's greater than or equal to two exaflops. And it most certainly does not take like a huge jump from like, you know, going above two exaflops to be able to go and kind of do the rest of that math and then get to a number that's exceeding one zettaflop. And so just to kind of give you some idea in terms of what the math is, I do think that that's why Aurora will be higher than two exaflops in terms of performance when it's launched next year in 2022. Okay, but let's get into the little piece of paper that Raja actually put at the top of the heading, the HPC strategy. And I'm just gonna kind of introduce this because you know the way we kind of were talking about it last night was really in terms of phases. And the first phase is really kind of like exascale. That's really that Aurora supercomputer. And then we're gonna kind of talk about how we get to Zeta scale and some of the innovations there. And we are gonna have, there are some new disclosures here uh, that are really important that you probably haven't heard of before. And so one of the things though, before we get there, I just wanna talk about the one API. So you can see one API on the left-hand side of this. And the important thing on the one API is that you're gonna see that like, you know, right now, uh, Roger says like, hey, this is kind of like one API version one, then we have version two and version three. And one of the things that if you do talk to Raja, one thing that he will talk a lot about uh, just in general is just the fact that, you know, if you ever come up with a new type of accelerator or any kind of new device, you need to have a couple things. And one of them is you need to have like an order of magnitude, better performance. So, uh, you know, you may have heard me say like graph cores performance on ML perf was um, really underwhelming. And, and that would be a good reason why, like, you know, you can't be 
just as good as Nvidia and say like, hey, I have a custom, I have a custom processor, AI processor that's, you know, basically somewhat along the lines of somewhere around what an A100 does. And like, that's not good enough to go and really kind of support a new device. But the other thing is also that you ha- you kind of have like a software and hardware contract that you have to have, right? Like you have to have the driver models and, you know, just figure out how to go and use these new devices. And so that's something that Raja talks about. And he's like, hey, the reason that we're doing this is GPU accelerator is really just because, you know, that kind of contract, uh, number one, people kind of understand how to use GPUs as accelerators for HPC and AI. And then number two, just the fact that we have this one API train going and we really are putting a ton of effort into one API and being able to support these new GPUs going forward. So I just kind of want to talk you know, in terms of software, that's a super important concept. And so let's just kind of put that in its place on the left-hand side here. Now, phase one in the Exascale era uh, is really 2022. Let's call it what it is. It's really the Ponte Vecchio in terms of the GPU accelerator side. And then also we have Sapphire Rapids in terms of the Xeon side. Now, there are two versions of Sapphire Rapids. And I actually just kind of asked Raja this, and I've asked a couple of folks now at Intel this, and they all kind of give me the same answer. And that's really that, you know, there is a model with Sapphire Rapids that does have integrated HBM. And the basic idea, if you have that high bandwidth memory on the package is that, you know, you you do kind of solve a little bit of that kind of memory bandwidth and latency uh, issue that you would have if you had to go to like DDR5 or something like that by, you know, actually integrating that HBM. But what everybody has basically told me is that that HBM product is most likely going to be HPC customers that do not use accelerators. And so they're really kind of more focused on like CPU uh, clusters, right? Those are the folks that are really going to use HBM on board. Sapphire Rapids without HBM is going to be more popular when paired with things like Ponte Vecchio in terms of accelerators. And on STH, we've definitely seen a bunch of different systems. Uh, actually, I mean, we had a Samsung system uh, that they showed off at the OCP Summit 2021 keynote last week. There's also a Flex Bodega Bay platform that we showed off. Uh, we saw another one uh, that we were actually going to publish uh, today, but we were going to publish a little bit, a little bit later at SC. And so, you know, the the fact that we have PCIe Gen 5, we have eight channel memory, we have DDR5, uh, CXL 1.1, all that kind of stuff is pretty well known in terms of Sapphire Rapids at this point. But at the same time, you know, the next generation supercomputer is going to use Sapphire Rapids plus Ponte Vecchio, and that'll give us Aurora, which will be, you know, our two exaflop or two plus exaflop system. But that's kind of like already in motion, right? So the next generation beyond that, you're going to see here, and you're going to see something that's like Xeon next and also. Ponte Vecchio next here. And well, the real reason for that is just uh, Raja and I looked at each other and uh, there's there's the next generation Xeon is actually called Granite Rapids. And we were looking at each other like, hey, hey, has has, uh, has anybody at Intel ever said that publicly that it's, that it's Granite Rapids? And normally I know this stuff like cold and I think Raja knows this stuff cold, but you know, we're talking about like 1, 2 a.m. here and uh, we, we just didn't know. So uh, that actually just was written down as Xeon next, but that's actually, you should read that as Granite Rapids, which will be the successor to Sapphire Rapids. And Raja really calls this whole Granite Rapids, and I'm not going to say I do know the name for it, but the next generation of Ponte Vecchio uh, accelerator, right? That that is really what he calls the optimizing exascale. So they're basically going to kind of build on the foundation that they already have with the existing Ponte Vecchio and Sapphire Rapids, and then kind of you know, more cores and and more execution units, memory, all that kind of stuff is going to go up. And so we're going to see kind of like a refinement of the products that are in the market. And so I don't really think that these are going to be the ones that, you know, you're not going to see like a 500x improvement in terms of performance in the optimizing exascale. It's really kind of a little bit later that we're going to get to that. But let's get to some of the new stuff that you've probably never heard before, because uh, I couldn't find a lot of the stuff online, actually. And so really, you know, from 2024 to 2025, Raja calls that the pre-Zeta scale era. And really, I think that he's not really targeting 26 for Zeta scale. So I, I don't know, maybe maybe 26 should be included in here, but it's written down as 24, 25. So that's what we're going to go with here. And there are definitely some new technologies that are super exciting. The first one is Falcon. And what basically Falcon is, is the idea of combining that CPU and GPU. NVIDIA this year made a big splash with Grace, which basically took an ARM CPU, it took ConnectX, uh, interconnect IP, along with a future GPU, put them all together and says like, hey, this is going to be our exascale compute unit. Well, Intel says, guess what? We have that as well. And it's called Falcon. 
And that level of integration, by the way, is super important because like if you don't have to go off package and or you don't need more certies or something like that, that actually saves a ton of power. I mean, those things are very expensive in terms of power, which means that you know you have more power to actually go do compute if you can get rid of it. And so this level of integration is important. And just as a little aside, but you know, maybe making this a little more accessible, if you think about what Apple actually did with the M1 and why people get really excited about it, one of the big reasons that it's so efficient is because there's just so much integrated directly onto the package that, you know, that that actually got them a lot of power efficiency by doing that. And so, you know, this is definitely the way that we're going to start seeing some of these high performance computing systems get made, is that they're going to do a lot more of that integration, right? Because it's just uh, way more power efficient than having to go off into a whole bunch of different packages. But that also means that you have to make decisions in terms of what you're going to be and what your saleable unit is, right? It's not going to be like, oh, I can, I'm going to go plug in my uh, NIC, and I'm going to go plug in my GPUs, and I'm going to go mix and match. If they're all integrated, you know, that's basically the unit that's being sold, and that needs to go be built into systems. So you don't really get that mix and match component anymore, but that high, higher level of integration actually gets you better power efficiency, and that helps a ton. But what happens when you do want to go off the package? And in fact, Roger is definitely thinking about that, and this is Probably, I mean, I've, I've probably been asking him this question since 2018 or something like that, or 19, like, hey, Roger, you know, when are we gonna start seeing silicon photonics? And he's like, well, it's not gonna be like, you know, seven to 10 years off, but it's also not gonna be two to three years off. And his actually, his roadmap right now is kind of right in that, that line. And basically here's the idea of the whole silicon photonics thing. This is called light bender. And the interesting part about it to me at least is that if you think about what I was talking about in terms of the process technology and going to tiles, well, Intel can actually make a silicon photonics tile. And then they can integrate that silicon photonics tile into something like a Xeon processor or a future accelerator or HPC, you know, kind of node or whatever. And if you don't know what silicon photonics are, that's actually basically taking light and going directly from a chip into light. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to go and traverse very long distances at low latency and high speed without the limitations that you have in terms of signal integrity due to like, you know, PCB and like copper wires and stuff like that. And so overall, I mean, this is the kind of thing that allows you to go and do things like have disk shelves that are different than your memory shelves that are different than your CPU shelves that are different than your accelerator and GPU shelves. I mean, this is the kind of the stuff that, you know, we've been talking about for probably two decades or something like that in the data center, but it's actually going to start happening. And the other thing that it allows you to do if you actually have a tile and you're integrating that tile into a chip, well, think about what that means for your memory. If I have a high bandwidth, low latency interface, well, I don't necessarily need to go and integrate things like HBM or some other kind of memory directly into a die at every step, I could actually go and put one of these and I can now go interface to remote memory. And that remote memory, if you kind of see what like IBM's doing with like OMI and stuff like that, well, I can start building those remote memory modules with a little tile that has silicon photonics built in, but I can go start building memory modules with, you know, crazy things, right? Like I, you could use HBM, but have a whole bunch of stacks and that gives you a lot more capacity. You could also do things like have a whole bunch of DDR5 or another memory type. And so you could do that in terms of memory. I mean, there's a whole bunch of really cool things that Silicon Photonics brings. And if you're able to go and bring things at almost native speeds directly and you know efficiently onto a package, well, that becomes a huge, huge thing for being able to go create bigger, more flexible, and frankly, more interesting systems. So Silicon Photonics 2024 to 2025 pre Zetascale architecture. Oh, and if you want to go from a CPU to GPU, you could do that instead of going like through motherboard traces, you could just do it between the, you know, photonics tiles, and you could basically just use fiber optic cables to go and hook up the two and get a lot faster. And you can even, you know, spread, spread the components out for better cooling or whatever you want. Now, when it comes to Zeta scale, there really is not that much here. Like, let's face it, this is a pretty empty page in terms of Zeta scale. And you might be like, ah, well, what's going on here? Well, I, they definitely do have products that they're building um, and stuff like that. Uh, they're just not on this page. But something I will tell you there is just, you know, really Raja's thinking about this in turn, or Intel's thinking about this in terms of like doing a Zeta scale system or one Zeta, Zeta flop system in a 50 megawatt envelope. Now you may not have your own like power generation station. You may not have your own like hydro dam or, or nuclear reactor or something like that sitting next to your facility. So like doing 50 megawatts, uh, not everybody can go do that. But on the flip side, think about what that means in terms of your architecture. If you're able to deliver one exaflop at 
50 megawatts, that also means that today's exascale system, that would be the fastest supercomputer in the world right now, or you know, right around that, that actually would then fit into a one one thousandth of the total power budget, which would put you at like 50 kilowatts. Now, 50 kilowatts is quite a bit, but on the other hand, it is something that you can definitely go find and put in racks today, and you can find ways to cool it today, and all of that kind of stuff. And what that practically means is that you can take something in maybe five or six years, and you'd be able to take something that is essentially the fastest supercomputer in the world today, and go put it basically at an edge location, right? You can go put a 50 kilowatt rack in a lot more places than a 50 megawatt supercomputer, right? And so that basically means that you're really democratizing the idea of high performance computing. I mean, literally most companies would be able to go and find a way to go get a 50 kilowatt rack and be able to go put in something that basically is the top of the line supercomputer today and be able to go just install that. And think about what that means like if you're in like oil and gas or you're in other industries where you can actually go get that level of super computer at that power and probably, you know, dollars per uh, flap and stuff like that. I mean, that is going to be an absolutely awesome and kind of game changing system when there's just that much compute in the world. Now, 100%, a lot of stuff has to go right here. Not all this technology is created. And so there are definitely risks to this whole thing. But it's just, just kind of cool to see how Raja is thinking about, well, OK, uh, we've put this this out there. How are we actually going to go build and get to something that is a thousand X? And you know, he has a kind of plan with some buckets and some line of sight into what they have today and what you know might need a little bit more development or they need to just go out and invent new. But overall, you know, he definitely has a plan for Zeta scale. And it's a little bit more than you know we're showing here. But it is really cool just to kind of go see. Also, you're going to note the dates on this just real quick. You're going to see 26, 27, 28. 27 was the original target. So he had had like 26 to 27. I was like, you know, why don't you just put 28 there just in case, give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. And that's why you see instead of like 26 to 28, you see 26, 27, 28. That's actually how that happened. Okay, now let's get to the final sheet just real quick. You're going to see that you know, you have this just phi, and that's actually the 21st letter of the Greek alphabet. And Raja actually tweeted out like, you know, phi is making a comeback or phi will be back. And he actually posted that on Twitter a little while ago. And everybody's like, hey, what's going on? Uh, just kind of something fun that he was just kind of sketching for me. He's like, hey, you know, one that like O in like one API, uh, well, that there's that kind of O and then there's the I at the end of API and that O I, you kind of put them together and you basically get that phi symbol. And I said to Raj, I said, please don't use that phi symbol because I don't want to have to type a Greek character in like every story for the next like five years. Like I just don't, this is going to take everybody in the industry like way too long to go do that. But phi I actually kind of like as a name. And I suggested like the phi 22. And so I think that's why you wrote that down. Somebody didn't tell is clearly going to go and get rid of that. But my idea behind the phi 22 was really that, you know, as you're going to go and start to integrate more of these components, the CPUs, the accelerators, GPUs, and then also things like the fabric uh, and network connectivity, as you start doing that integration, it kind of makes sense to just say like, hey, this is like our 2022 architecture, which is going to be Sapphire Rapids, and it's also going to be Ponte Vecchio. Then also, this is going to be our 2023, which is going to be Granite Rapids. And nope, not going to say it but their GPU for the next generation as well. And that could be something like Phi 23. I know somebody at Intel is going to say absolutely no way, but that was kind of why that's written there. It's just kind of an idea that happened at like, I don't know, midnight or 1 a.m. or something like that. Okay, so overall, I just want to say thank you again to Raja for like saying, hey, why don't we just, great seeing you, like, let's go get a beer. Um, that was actually awesome to get to go and kind of see Intel's plan for the next couple of years. And like, frankly, isn't this just kind of a cool format? I mean, like, normally what we get from Intel is like, we get these like super manicured, just slides and like, they're like, okay, you know, we can't say this, we can't say this, we can't say this. And then, you know, this is kind of the, hey, we're at a, we're just kind of having some beers and like, you know, just kind of scribbling stuff with some Cool Ranch Doritos on the side. I mean, it's just kind of a fun way to get to do it because normally a lot of the Intel stuff is extremely sterile and this is uh, definitely, definitely not as sterile, but it was just kind of cool to get to go and actually go do, finally traveling to a trade show for once. Well, at least once in many years. But anyway, hey guys, let me know if you like this. I know there's not a ton of B-roll because this was like super informal, but I do think it is super interesting and this is an exclusive story. So it's pretty awesome. If you did like this video, well, definitely go comment, but also give this video a like, click subscribe, turn on notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.